We've been fighting a long time, and we have all lost so very much. So many loved ones gone. But you are not alone. There are pockets of resistance all around the planet. We are at the brink. You have no idea how important you are. If you're listening. Everybody, Steve with Sons Fidelity. I'm coming back with our first guest of the podcast, the history of the podcast, our friend Jonathan Arrington. And Jonathan, welcome back. He just had a baby last night. Now, now he didn't have one. His wife had one. He was he was assisting. He got the assist for this. But uh, first, congratulations and welcome back, bud. Thank you. Thank you. Always great to hang out with a friend from South Carolina. Yes, yes. <laughs> the South will rise again in a, in a different way. <laughs> That's right. So Jonathan is a what you get a doc, and not, you're working on the doctorate or you got the masters in patristics so i did all the doctoral studies at the patristicum or the augustinianum uh, so, school for study of patristics in rome so the patristics, patristics for him is like throwing a uh a two oak a fastball right down the middle and it's like a meatball <laughs> this is right in his wheelhouse so he came up with this idea of doing a study on the patristics and so we're hopefully we'd get a series out of this so Something about St. Irenaeus of Lyon is coming up soon, and he came up with this idea. Let's do one on St. Irenaeus right off the bat. So, Jonathan, can you tell us a little bit more about that and why him, and, and what do you want to talk about? Well, uh, why him, part of it has got to be that uh, Pope Francis is going to name him a doctor of the church coming up very soon from what he uh, had just announced, I think it was last week. Uh, but the, I'd say probably even a more important reason is that uh, he's really the foundation of the study of patristics. I mean, it, it in some measure really starts with him. You know, the, there's the so-called uh, apostolic fathers. So you got the fathers that uh, some part of the time overlap in their lives with St. John, you know, the latest of the apostles to die. So you got people like St. Ignatius of Antioch and St. Polycarp. Uh, so uh, right after that mark of St. Polycarp, the last one to really uh, spend some any significant time with one of the apostles, St. Poly, uh, Polycarp uh, also had the grace to spend some time with St. Irenaeus or vice versa. So the you could say uh, the post-apostolic age really begins with St. Irenaeus. So it's, you know, then you're finally dealing with uh, the, the seriousness of tradition. You know, are we passing on exactly what the apostles uh, passed are passed on, which they received from the Lord. So uh, yeah, it, it really becomes uh, a serious thing with Saint Irenaeus, and, and he recognizes that. So he he's kind of one of the the first ones to distinguish between uh, scripture, tradition, and magisterium in the general sense. That is the teaching of the the bishops in union with the, the bishop of Rome uh, as the authentic. Um, well, he called it the, the 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 canon or rule of faith. You know, uh, so that he's. He's kind of a, a, a mark from the passing over from the apostolic age to the, the rest of the patristic era, and I guess you could say the rest of church history. So he's really important. So what do we want to do is kind of give like a 101 lesson about, uh, I'm, I'm sure you know, I don't want to get to the an eight hour dis, uh, discussion about St. Iron Age. You could probably do it. And you could probably do it. I, would, I won't put it past you. But uh, if anybody don't know him, uh, Jonathan is just a wealth of info. If you have him in his class, you're lucky to have him for your teacher. So uh, thank him for this. I'll leave him underneath in the show notes. You need to contact him for any information. So let's, Jonathan, the floor is yours, sir. Okay. Yeah, I guess the, the big thing with St. Irenaeus is that uh, he's known for having fought the Gnostics in the early church, right? So they are a a sect. Of what, in fact, St. Irenaeus is one of the first ones to really uh, – codify the term heresy and uh, heresy arc. So those who start heresies and the Gnostics did it basically uh, and, and set a form for all heretics after their day by saying that there's this bit of, you know, knowledge that you have to hang out with us to perceive and to get right. And, uh, but clearly distinct from the Catholic church, which opens up her, her wealth of knowledge on salvation to, to anybody and everybody uh, regardless of their 
you know, form of preparation, whatever they had done uh, before that point in their lives. And you could even say, no matter what their their willingness to embark on a, a life of, of penance and and you know, early church pretty serious about fasting. So no matter how you know penitential you were or something like that, how hard you set the bar for, the bar for yourself, uh, you know, Catholic Church is just willing to take you in. We'll take you in, you know, uh, all, all sinners and do what we can with them. We'll take them where they are and try to make saints out of them. But the Gnostics, you know, uh, were just like a lot of the other heretics throughout history and uh, set the bar where they thought it should be set and then didn't let anybody else in, you know, into their kind of uh, clique, you could say. So St. Irenaeus uh, calls him out on that early on. But his biggest thing is just showing kind of the internal contradictions of their um, their, their particular theology, right? And that, that's basically been the work of every Catholic apologist since St. Irenaeus is to say, all right, you guys say that you have something that the Catholic Church does not have and does not offer to the general mass of the faithful. Tell us a little bit more about it, or you know, let's let's take what you said about it and let's examine it. And so he does it, you know, with the same kind of fine-tooth comb that St. Thomas Aquinas and others will do, St. Robert Bellarmine will do later on. And he just, he finds the internal contradictions. You could say kind of the uh, cognitive dissonance, you know, between what they're even uh, saying and doing, you know. And um, that that's his big thing. And it's kind of providential, too, that uh, Pope Francis would want to name him a doctor of the church because St. Irenaeus, uh, kind of got a bad rap over the last, uh, what we say, maybe 40, 50 years, because um, not too long ago, uh, the Gospel of Thomas, the, uh, the the fullest version we have of it, pretty much complete version of the Gospel of Thomas, and a few other Gnostic uh, texts were found you know, buried somewhere up in northern Egypt, and a lot of religious scholars, especially like the Ivy League uh, religious scholars, quote-unquote, I wanted to make a big deal out of it and, and say that, you know, these people have been maligned before and we just, we weren't giving them a, a chance. But I mean, come to find out St. Irenaeus, I mean, uh, like, like St. Thomas Aquinas, he laid out their arguments better than they did, it seems like. Uh, and was, you could say he was charitable with them about uh, what they were saying and trying to give them uh, some benefits of the doubt. But he, he just pointed out something that's been the case with almost every single heretical group too, is that they... Uh, Nine times out of ten, they end up setting this this really high bar in regard to uh, continency and, and and sexual relationships. And ninety nine times out of hundred, maybe even they end up not only uh, not uh, following up with what they demand of others, especially their their higher ups. But I mean, not going along with the, the Ten Commandments, just in general, like six and the Ninth Commandments. So he, just, he brought that up, but uh, you could count on the. Um, authoritative religious scholars at the Ivy League schools to, to not take too kindly to that. So they didn't. Like there's this, um, there's a famous female scholar, uh, kind of feminist theologian, I think is what she probably called herself, who just, I mean, what, going into St. Irenaeus like there's there's no tomorrow, um, and, you know, saying that he was just too hard on the Gnostic, so on and so forth, and just basically used him as a, a punching bag, you know, of sorts. But um, I mean, it turns out most most people kind of after the fact, after this um, this uh, attack on Saint Irenaeus, they, they start reading through these documents at Nag Hammadi is what it's called, Nag Hammadi up in uh, uh, northern Egypt. They, they start looking through the stuff and think, you know what? I mean, it seems like Saint Irenaeus did kind of he he gave him a, a fair shot, you know. And this Doctor Pagels from uh, from Harvard or Princeton, I can't. She either went to Harvard and taught at Princeton or vice versa. Um, that she she was actually, you know, uh took aim at, at St. Irenaeus without without reason. So that that's kind of the the backdrop is that St. Irenaeus has had um some folks coming after him hard and heavy uh ever since that the discovery of the uh Nag Hammadi Gnostic documents up in uh in um northern Egypt. And nevertheless, I mean, people are coming to see that he was. He was pretty faithful about passing on what they had said and has um, has stood the test of time in that regard. But the biggest thing is that he he gives us the first cohesive theology of so many things. I mean, he's everybody's heard of the comparison between our Lord as the new Adam, right? Our Lady as the new Eve. That's St. Irenaeus, right? So, I mean, besides just the whole uh, scripture tradition and then magisterium or teaching of the success of the apostles as the uh, the proximate, you know, or immediate, and then remote rules of faith, as they're called, 
uh, you got him giving us the, the first sense of like how to make sense out of the Old Testament together with the New, right? It's this idea of the New Testament being, uh, you say, buried in the Old, right? And that the Old Testament is just revealed in the New. This is all St. Irenaeus. He says it, you know, uh, pretty quickly and in and, and simpler form maybe than some later authors would, but uh, a lot of these later authors admit, like, I got this from St. Irenaeus, you know, and his uh, adversus heresies. So uh, that's that's kind of the, the main part of, of why he's so important. Wasn't he one of the first ones to write the popes in order? So he, that, that's right. He did start uh, talking about the, the different popes, what they had done, stuff like that. And um, a, a lot of what we have from his uh, interactions with the popes and his listing of the popes comes to us kind of indirectly because it comes to Eusebius of Caesarea. But yeah, I mean, yeah, you're right. He's the one that, that, that talks about uh, the, the lineage of the popes. And in fact, you know, that's a good point because uh, uh, Eusebius, you know, his ecclesiastical history, he talks about how, you know, uh, St. Irenaeus got to be named Bishop of, uh, of Lyon, you know, basically modern day Lyon, uh, by taking a letter to po the Pope. You might be thinking, like, why does somebody travel all the way from ancient Gaul? You know, it's, it's not a, an easy trip. Uh, so why, why is he sent there as a, as a, still as a priest? to go kind of present papers to the Bishop of Rome. Well, because the Bishop of Rome had a, a central role in the governance of the entire church. And so that's why then uh, some years after he's uh, named Bishop there in Lyon, by the then Pope, he's gonna write to Pope Victor and, and talk about uh, kind of a big liturgical uh, controversy of his day. Uh, basically folks kind of celebrating Easter on different days. I and mean, it's called the Quart uh, Quarto Deciman controversy or basically whether or not to celebrate Easter always on the 14th day of Nisan, uh, not the car, you know, but <laughs> the uh, Hebrew month. And uh, but he's writing to the Pope about it, you know, and saying, that I, I beg you to, to go easy on them, to just settle this in a way that there's, there's peace and that nobody's booted out too quickly from the communion with the Catholic Church. So I mean, St. Irenaeus is making it clear, Pope, the Pope of Rome, the Bishop of Rome, has the ability to say whether or not somebody's in communion with the Catholic Church, you know? I mean, it's just huge. Uh, it's so much that we count on as just uh, givens in Catholic theology. It, it's all there in, in St. Irenaeus. And without him, uh, this stuff would be on, you know, more tenuous ground. Uh, the, the historical uh, revisionism, people would just be all over it and, you know, uh, second-guessing stuff. But thanks to St. Irenaeus's works, it's just, it's there in black and white, literally, and there's not much you can do to get away from it. Was there, you say, when after the Gnostics, was there a different flavor of Gnosticism than his time versus, say, like St. John the Apostle? And what made him go after them like he did? Well, that's, that's a real good question. So, uh, and that's one of the things that these, um, uh, modern day Ivy League squat scholars like to uh, contest. They like to say that uh, Saint, you, you got these folks, especially after the time of St. Paul, they want to say, and after the time of St. John the Apostle, who um, made up a lot of stuff about the Gnostics, which is not true. And I mean, incredibly, the, the, some of them are, these are really intelligent people, or, or you know, at least you could say intellectually gifted, who've written about this. I mean, their, their stuff was seen for kind of the, um, the, the forced argument that it was. So more level-headed scholars in patristics, even though, even though patristics has is, is kind of had a rough time of it as far as orthodoxy over the last 40 years or so, uh, they've, they pretty much sided, I'd say the majority, with the, the view that St. Irenaeus is, is faithfully laying out what the Gnostics in his day believed, and it's... Uh, I guess the best way to put it is it's a, a more codified and, and, and solidified version of what they were already saying in the time of St. John the Apostle and even in the time of St. Paul, right? So the, especially that Nagel's lady I was talking about earlier, Pagel, sorry, uh, she's big on saying, yeah, there's you got uh, forgeries among St. Paul's letters because they wanted to go after the Gnostics in the you know 70s, 80s, and 90s AD, so well after St. Paul had, had died, right? Um, but incredibly, I mean, because there, there's not a lot of uh, encouraging news sometimes out of the orthodoxy of the patristic scholars of our day, but 
that's one of them, I think, is that they, they just said, yeah, they, I mean, we, we'd like to believe you, basically. Um, but, yeah, it seems like St. Irenaeus is, is, is being pretty faithful here, uh, just in, in giving him a fair shot, comparing what was discovered there in Upper Egypt, Nag Hammadi, and what he wrote. Well, he seems to be pretty much on the ball here, and um, especially with the main point, that the Gnostics were pretending to have a knowledge that you could only get through them and only through their certain ascetical practices, right? Um, and I guess you'd say that the big difference is they, they they kind of saw it as something that you could attain by your own efforts, you know? And so uh, this to me would be the, the biggest, um, how should I say, uh, the, the most Catholic thing about St. Irenaeus is he says, look, uh, what... Uh, authentic Catholic teachers had to pass on. It's it's a gift. It's something they've received from someone else. It's not something they could grasp on their own, right? It's not something where if I fast enough or if I do this or if I do that, if I check off all these boxes, then God's going to automatically give me this this sort of uh, higher level of knowledge. No, it's just it, it's a gift. And then revelation that was given to certain the apostles, the gift to them, and they were humble enough to recognize it, receive it, and then pass it on. But it's not something you can you know attain or obtain by uh, just checking off the different ascetical practices that you, you know. St. Irenaeus is big on, on uh, ascetic practices, right, uh, fasting and, and prayer. Uh, he talks about it all the time. He's just saying that's not some sort of automatic, uh, <laughs> thereafter you're always going to get a certain level of gnosis or knowledge, you know, that's going to be uh, in demand by everybody. Was it kind of like a spiritual works only idea? Uh, you, you could say that, yeah, yeah. And so that's why, you know, uh, some of the more poignant things in sacred scripture about the necessity of faith and then even obedience to the faith. You know, that famous term uh, from St. Paul, obedience to the faith. Uh, that's, that's something that, you know, these scholars that want to say that these were later Pauline controversies and it didn't actually, the Gnostics weren't alive during the days of St. Paul or St. John. Uh, it's probably something that... that eats at them, right? Uh, that um, obedience to faith and actually faith itself uh, was was critical for the passing on of the faith in the very beginning. Uh, and I, I dare say, I was just uh, talking with a friend about this. It's something that also comes up in, in such a great expositor or explainer of the faith, like St. Robert Bellerman. I was talking to somebody about this just recently um, from our, our friend Ryan Grant's recent articles on St. Robert Bellerman. It's, it's when you know you have a true doctor of the church, is that humility just to say, Here's what the greats, or St. Irenaeus, obviously it's mainly the apostles and, and St. Polycarp, but here's what the greats before me have said. This, this is in line with the truth of what the church still teaches. So here's what I'm passing on to others. It's just that these are geniuses. St. Robert Bellman, St. Irenaeus, geniuses. Brilliant. But they're humble enough to just say, uh, this comes from God. I, I'm not going to dare try to add or do or subtract from this because this is, this is divine revelation, you know. What are some... I know you, you probably have his quotes in the back of your head. What are some uh, things that he said that could be apt for today that he was so talking about back then? Um, well, yeah, in fact, I was reading through just today some of his, uh, the fragments of his work. So like some of the things that aren't in his main work called uh, Addresses Heresies or Against the Heresies. And it, oh my word, I was just underlining some great one-liners and uh, they're, they're all throughout there. You, you can find them if you look in, you know, the Patrologia Latina mm -hmm. or the Patrologia Greca. you got the two different patrology sets by Migne, the famous uh, French collator of all the patristic artists. So his is in the Patrologia Greca, his Greek father. But uh, one of the ones I underlined for myself, having, you know, six kids to raise and, and make sure they get good stuff right off the bat, is that the lessons we learn as children are... Uh, more forcefully implanted on the soul and become almost one with the soul. He's, he's, he's um, talking about this in one of his fragments there because talking about the influence that St. Polycarp had on him as a child and that St. John had on St. Polycarp as a child, right? So these, these first impressions that children have become almost one with the soul. He's, this was one of the other great ones though, in that same uh, excerpt, that the second excerpt of his fragments. He said, uh, the incredible thing is that heretics in, inside the church uh, dare to say things that folks outside the church would never dare to say, right? And so it's almost like that old um, that old Latin saying you probably heard, corruptio optimi pessima, right? The corruption of the best becomes the worst. And he, he kind of gives us a, um, 
I guess you could say a theological version of that, right? Heretics end up making for the worst uh, philosophers, the worst sociologists, psychologists, you name it. They end up doing a lot of damage. Um, oh, he had this beautiful thing where he's talking about uh, kind of the, the, the speaking of St. Polycarp, and he said, his, things were in, his sayings were in symphony with the Holy Scriptures at all times. Whatever he said was in symphony with the Holy Scriptures. You know, beautiful music stuff. Oh, oh no, here, here's the best one. Here's the best one right here, Steve. So, you know, we're talking about all the crazy stuff that's happening in the world and uh, looking like it's apocalyptic out there. And St. Irenaeus was convinced, as was St. Polycarp, that, you know, their, their day seemed a lot like the, the last days as well. But he's got this quote where he says here, Oh, good God. And I mean, not as like a kind of like a, a curse or anything. Just right. Oh, God, you are good. Oh, good God, uh, who has uh, saved me for such times as these, you know, uh, that I might put up with all these things. <laughs> I mean, like he, he saw it as a way, he talks about it a little bit later on, as a way to, of, of uniting himself with, with Christ's cross, right? It's like, do, do I want to get out of carrying the cross? I and mean, that would make me not an authentic Christian, right? So basically, thank you, God, for saving me for such difficult times I could deal with something, you know, even in a minuscule manner uh, akin to what you uh, dealt with. He was, so he wasn't one of those, oh, I wish I was living back in the 1500s or I wish I was living in the 200s. I'm oh, glad I'm living in the here and now. Oh, no. no. He's he's thanking God for the ability to, uh, the grace, you could say, to be fighting in a, in a rough time. And when, right after Marcus Aurelius was there, who, you know, uh, might have been a, a relatively well-known philosopher, but hated the, the Catholics and, and persecuted them mercilessly. You know, he's living in those days and, and thanking God for it, you know. And, and, and when you've got uh, not just all kinds of heretics that are pulling thousands of people away from the Catholic Church, the Gnostics, but then you've got, you know, this really, I mean, kind of like our days where you've got this internal liturgical dispute that, I mean, is threatening to pull the church apart. I mean, that, it, it was coming to a head there. Where it was looking like there was going to be this huge split and that lots of folks who uh, were from his native place, more kind of Greek speaking areas, Smyrna, um, that they were just going to be kind of cut off from the Catholic communion by the Pope. Uh, you know, because some matters liturgical have to be a matter of discipline as well. Uh, but he just, he, he steps in the breach, you know, he intercedes and says, please, uh, Pope, can we, um, can we salvage this so that, 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 that peace is preserved and that, uh, the word he used actually communion is preserved, right? So are you trying yeah. to tell me that there was a time before our time that it wasn't all sunshine and lollipops in the church? Oh, man. Oh, man. I mean, it, it, there, there might have been a few moments of sunshine, like uh, looking back on the days when he got to hear St. Polycarp speak. But um, it, he was in a perpetual battle all his life for, for the souls that were already in the church to try to preserve them in the faith and to try to win souls back to the church that had left the church. And then, you know, uh, to evangelize. He, he's not, he was known in his day as a missionary bishop, you know, so... Um, yeah, I mean, you could say France has always had uh, this, this good string of missionary bishops, and, and he might have been, you know, really the authentically the first. Why um, were these Gnostics so good at pulling us out? I mean, the, the way St. Irenaeus puts it, uh, it it's kind of like St. Uh, Thomas's argument for the danger of uh, the vice of curiosity, right? So it's like, you know, if you're not content with the things the church makes clear to everyone. And this is it, Here, here's our catechesis, here's our, our doctrine, here's our dogma. Come learn it, come, you know, come sit at the feet of the church and, and learn it, soak it up, take the time and the effort to, to study it, to pray over it, to meditate on it. Um, then there's this, this sense in which curiosity did just kill the cat, but it ends up like killing the soul, right? And so you're, you're looking for something extra, something more uh, that is, is not what the church has already said. And, and you know, if you, if you go looking for it in all the wrong places, which is what a lot of these uh, early followers of the Gnostics did, then um, it becomes, a, I guess you'd say it's two different things. It, the, the Gnostics knew how to play on our natural propensity after original sin to be curious about things that, you know, we don't know about, that curiosity know both good and evil. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I, I, I guess you said the other thing was kind of being part of the, uh, the special group, right? The elect. Uh, that uh, but it elect in a sense, not like the church used it. Um, and, uh, you know, that somehow if you were in, in that group, you wouldn't have to go through what all the other, the hoi polloi, all the other many, many Catholics uh, put up with. And um, so, so part of that might have just been a, both curiosity, and I guess you say humility was the other thing, humility versus pride. I mean, St. Irenaeus uh, says in several different places, uh, even in his, his more uh, fragmented works and his versus heresies, that uh, it, it basically all of human uh, salvation history is a matter of the uh, interplay between uh, pride and humility, right? Are you going to accept the path that God has, has clearly shown you here for your life, or are you going to act like you're better than God and, and you know, draw down your own path? Um, I remember hearing yeah, that's, I remember hearing Augustine line of uh, heretics are zealous while Catholics are lazy. Does Irenaeus talk about the the laity in general in the or the, in that time uh, how their mindsets were to be easily t you know fished out basically? Yeah, he does, um, and and I guess you know part of that. Yeah, you you might see some of that zeal. Uh, in his description of, you know, why folks were, were wanting to leave the church in order to pursue these other groups. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's a good way of putting it. So maybe the, the better way to think of it would be that St. Irenaeus wants to warn folks in his versus heresies that uh, zeal can be a good thing. You can use zeal, and obviously kind of in a natural sense, it, it usually is a good thing, if you uh, focus it in the right direction. Uh, if you... Yeah, but use it in, in line with, with what the church says you, you should be doing. Um, so he, he's got you know this one line where he talks about um, God's providence directing all things, God's providential will directing all things, right? And so as long as you trust in that, then you should be able to uh, submit in your humility and say, whatever is going on right now, both in, in my life and life of the church, like, God knows what he's doing here, and I'm just going to keep being you know, a good Catholic right here where I am and, and not assume that, uh, you know, just because I'm going through a difficult spot or the church is going through a difficult spot, then, you know, the church must have fallen away from the truth or I must have fallen away from the truth. It might actually be the opposite, right? That you're, you're doing good stuff and that's why uh, that's why Satan's come at, coming after you so hard, right? I, I don't know, did, did I... Did I yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? I, I was just thinking, what are some topics in Adversus Heresies that he covers? Well, uh, I'd say the number one thing is he wants to show, well, there might be a few number ones, but one of the things is to show the cohesiveness between the Old and the New Testament, mm -hmm. because, you know, you still don't have, uh, to a certain extent, an authoritative list of all the books of the Bible, right? He's going to quote from some of the, uh, the books obviously, that, that uh, Catholics and, and, and Orthodox have kept the Protestants kicked out. But uh, his big thing is also to show that you know, there's a cohesiveness to, to both Testaments together as part of, uh, as he calls it over and over again, just the, the writings, right, the, the scriptures, uh, the things the church reads authoritatively as, as what actually happened in salva throughout salvation history. You know? So showing how those two things go together, because one of the other uh, big problems with the Gnostics is that they wanted to uh, create kind of, I mean, this, this is, oversimplifying just a tad, but that they did want to kind of uh, create distinct divinities or, or um, folks who are overseeing what's going on in the Old Testament versus the New Testament, right? In fact, I've got, yeah, 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 uh, in the Patrologia Greca, in the mean, right, uh, it, they, they've got this little drawing where uh, it basically takes what St. Irenaeus wrote and shows this... Um, and it, this seems to be verified from the Gnostic writings, the kind of interplay between the different divinities or, or kind of, uh, what would you put them? I, I guess creatures underneath uh, the, the, the all-powerful, you know, who, who share, I mean, it sounds more like the Greek and the Roman pantheon than anything mm -hmm. that, that we uh, know, know much else of. But just showing how that, that is, that's ridiculous, you know, there'd there be too many fighting forces and who's, Who's going to come out on top? The one that's most powerful. Why is the one that was most powerful in the Old Testament not the same one that's most powerful in the New Testament? You know, so he, he brings up the internal contradictions of those things, but uh, he, he, the, the goal is to show you that the, the same God who is the author of all salvation history is the author of the Old Testament, and he's the author, the primary author 
of the New Testament as well, right? And and still working through uh, weak men in the New Testament as he was in the Old Testament. You know, Moses had his feelings, the others. But in modern day, through. would that be that, uh, oh, the uh, Old Testament God is a different than the New Testament God? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, that was a, a clear, uh, that was clearly in his aim was to combat that, yeah, even back in the day. So, like, so, so Serenthus was who St. John was writing about. He was what? It was an Ebionite that was the spirit that the flesh, that's the whole point of the flesh. It was the flesh was bad and, and there's the whole the spirit thingies and all this and there's some kind of weird, I don't know, anything just, yeah, you, well, you get it. The spirit idea, no flesh, spirit yeah. bad, <clears throat> matrimony bad, suicide is good, things like this. Was this kind of the same Baskin Robbins flavor or different? Uh, I mean, it, with a swirl, yeah, with a swirl. Just, <laughs> yeah. So basically, the same flavor, but uh, dressed up a little bit differently. Yeah, and um, that's why. Uh, I, I, I guess, I like, what would the danger, the physical dangers of what they were talking about? Like, like these guys, a lot of these heretics were going, you know, like, marriage was bad, suicide was a virtue, kind of inverted mm -hmm. everything. What were they doing? All this inversions as well. Yeah, they were. And that's, um, I, I guess that, that's probably one of the most important things that St. Irenaeus is, is getting across as well, is that uh, the God who who knew to create us as a body-soul composite, and he, he talks a lot about, you know, the, the, the inner work is the body and the soul. Um, the, the God who knew to create us that way uh, back in Genesis, you know, uh, two, and then seeing what happened with Genesis three, right? I mean, some sort of eating that uh, led to our fall. I mean, some some sort of cooperation of body and soul was the original sin as well. Uh, even if it would, you know, started out more primarily in the interior with the desire to disobey God because you felt like you knew more than God, right? Or wanted to know more than God, be like God's. Uh, so yeah, he sees that as as kind of the uh, a, a, a line that that connects all of salvation history exactly this this kind of fight between the the, the flesh and the spirit and just you know knowing when uh, the flesh has to submit to the spirit but not because the flesh is intrinsically evil right but because the spirit's supposed to know better is it, it, it is you know you've heard from God and he even talks about that like you know the, the very faculties that we're given in our sense especially sight and hearing he talks about a lot. Um, to, to to hear God's message, right? Uh, you know, they're supposed to cooperate. You know, we, we hear God's message, we, we think about it, we ponder, okay, here's how I have to react, you know, with my body and my soul, kind of the ascent of, of the will, but also doing certain things with your body. You know, God God gave us that. You know? I mean, he, he could communicate to us, obviously, in, in the way that he does the angels, so that it's more immediate and it's without the mediation of the senses, but he knew how he wanted to create us and, and how he wanted to communicate these things to us. So, yeah, I, I said there's certainly uh, he's he's fighting a very, very similar fight to the one that, that St. John, even to a certain extent, St. Paul's fighting about uh, these, uh, especially St. Paul like in the letters to Corinthians and things like that, about, um, yeah, trying try to consider the flesh in some way, shape or form, just intrinsically evil, bad or, you know, you got to fill in the blank with the center now. I guess I don't know about this. How how successful was he? Because obviously, I don't think Gnosticism ended. Another version probably came up afterwards. But how was he on getting people back? And maybe future arguments by people down down the road were using him. I, well, like obviously, like you know, Bellman. But how successful so, was he? That's a great question. It seems like, uh, given how uh, the the arguments with the Gnostics are not too frequent after him, uh, it seems reasonable to conclude that he uh, was really, really successful, very successful. Someone wrote out what they believed, showed all the internal contradictions, and because, you know, the the elite of the Roman and Greek society, I mean, the Roman Empire, but a lot of them Greek-speaking, and his work was translated into Latin at a very, very early date, very early. Some people even think maybe by, you know, uh, under his supervision, um, because the Romans and the Greeks were still pretty haughty about, you know, being seen as, as irrational or illogical, that, that would have been the ultimate insult, you know, like you're, you're a wussy or whatever else nowadays. Again, that for them, it would have been if you're uh, irrational, right? Especially after Marcus Aurelius, who was the emperor um, right, right, kind of in the early days of Cinderneus' life. Um, 
So yeah, when he lays out uh, how inconsistent they are, it seems like he, he struck a blow that was kind of the, the final death blow for them, at least at, at, at that time and in that spot of the, the Roman Empire, uh, because there doesn't seem to be a lot of fights with them later on. He, I mean, he's quoted a lot by later fathers, but, um, you know, like, a, Tertullian, like Tertullian even, who's not exactly a father, but, you know, pretty important early church writer, quotes him a fair bit. Started but, out really I mean, good. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. And, and that same kind of uh, um, anti-Catholic war on the flesh is what, you know, ends up driving him out of the church. But, um, yeah, so it, it, it seems like he was pretty effective because— the fight uh, was was elsewhere, for the, for the most part, after after he wrote this work, you know, and after he got out there. You mentioned the one website, and obviously a versus heresies. Uh, are there any other books or websites to go to to learn more about him? Um, so I, I know I checked on this at some point. I know LibriVox has the versus heresies um, in English read out loud. I think you can go through almost all of it, like listening to it even as, as, a, as a free audio book, there was, let me see here, uh, there, there I, I would look on uh, New Advent because I know that they were the only, the, the same website that has the Summa translated in English and, and the um, Old Catholic Encyclopedia, they had uh, some of his fragments translated into English, which are some, some really, really interesting and, and short, you know, but it's interesting to hear what he had to say. And uh, his uh, demonstration of the uh, of the faith as well, which is kind of an early apologetics book. It's a, a little bit sh shorter. So there's some of that on uh, the New Advent website, and I'm pretty sure that Documenta Catholica Omnia has the reference to uh, you know the, all the different English translations of his works there. That, that that's a great site. That Documenta Catholica Omnia. It's got uh, basically any important. Catholic writer and find their, their works there, and, and usually in an English translation as well. I forgot about Jurgens. Oh, yeah, 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 certainly, certainly. Um, what would you like to leave people with uh, regarding St. Irenaeus? Again, we've already gone to why is important, etc., and the Pope about to make him a doctor in the church, but if you were to tell him, say, you need to study him because of X, Y, Z, and learn more about him. Uh, what would you like in 40,000 words or less? <laughs> Here, here's what I'd say. So, I mean, clearly he was really intelligent. He had studied a lot. He had listened a lot to people who were who knew the faith really well. But you can tell that with him, it wasn't just an academic exercise, you know. It wasn't just so he could learn more, so he could refute somebody and, you know, like, hey, I, I came out on top in this, this argument. You could tell that he meditated and, and reached you know, high-level contemplation because he he sees things, and, and all you have to do is read a verse of Pharisees, read a few of his little excerpts there on, on uh, New Adam and New Eve, for instance, would be a great spot to, to focus on. And uh, he sees things in the, the plain text of sacred scripture that you know only come through some serious meditation. You know, looking at sacred scripture being quiet over it for a while and just meditating on it. I mean, doing what all the great saints have done for 2,000 years, just letting God speak to you through um, the sacred scriptures. But, you know, as always, since he's a good Catholic doctor, in union with the church, you know, what, what has St. Polycarp, well, especially think about it, that line from St. John to St. Polycarp to St. Irenaeus, of course he's going to see these connections that influence Our Lady and her key role uh, with part that, that heel crushing Satan's head because he talks a lot about uh, Genesis 3 and what goes on there. So, you know, listening to what the church has said through these uh, authoritative teachers like St. John and St. Polycarp allowed him to see things that, you know, were just were, were crucial for the spiritual life, the importance of the Blessed Virgin Mary for the spiritual life, for instance, you know, and, and the effects of original sin on our, our tendency to pride and curiosity. Right there, I mean, that, and that's something that St. Thomas Aquinas is going to really make the backbone of his theology is, is, is making sure we get, get pride and curiosity out and let's, let's have studiosity and humility. You know, that's how we'll make progress in theology. So simple, so, right? Um, yeah. It, well, yeah, so simple and, and yet the most difficult thing in the world to, to see through to completion. You know? yeah. Almost like, nah, it's too, too hard. We got to do, there's something else got to be involved here. 
Yeah, it's, it's, that, it's that daily grind. It's like getting to the gym or, or you know, uh, playing a sport, just going over the same fundamentals day in and day out. And it, it could seem boring to the outsider, but you know, like if, if you want to make progress, that's what you're going to do. And so spiritual life uh, seems to have that same sort of stick to itness. You know, if you stick with it and you keep doing this, repetition is going to be the mother of your studies and the mother Here, of your I was just about to say that. Repetition of my studiorum. <laughs> that's it. Jonathan, appreciate it. Thank you very much. And um, who's the next one you want to go over? Oh, um, let, let me let me pray about that. <laughs> I don't know. There, there, there's so many good ones out there. I have to think about, you know, who, who fits well, maybe uh, segueing in from... Uh, the time it is. Day. I mean, like I said, this uh, Jonathan hit me up, texted me up, hey, let's do Irenaeus uh, this week. I, okay, sure. <laughs> All right, Jonathan, appreciate it as always. And yeah, talk soon. All right. God bless you. Thank you.